Hello everyone, I'm Mark Plotkin, Dr. Mark Plotkin of the Amazon Conservation Team. You can find us on the web at www.amazonteam.org. I'm also the host of the podcast, Plants of the Gods. I want to share some good news with you. Plants of the Gods has just crossed north of 300,000 downloads. Uh, I'd like to point out that the first 250,000 uh, was just me, one old white guy with a microphone. And then we brought on uh, Paul Stamets, one of my mycological heroes. And those of you who know uh, and love Stamets and his work, uh, most famously known for the incredible movie, Fantastic Fungi, my job was to get Stamets to open up and tell stories he doesn't usually tell. So if you're really interested in mushrooms, uh, if you're really interested in magic mushrooms, you definitely need to listen to Plants of the Gods podcast, two parts with Paul Stamets. As I said, Stamets was... Uh, the star of the movie Fantastic Fungi, which is the greatest film on fungi ever made. Uh, executive producer in part was my pal Bill Benenson, Lori Benenson. So this is a film that I want to recommend to everybody. And one of the most interesting things about the film Fantastic Fungi is there's a companion volume, which is just as good as the film, with essays by people like Stamets, uh, my pal Michael Pollan, uh, Andy Weil, the famous Harvard physician who was originally an undergraduate ethnobotany student of Schulte's. So it all kind of ties together in a really shamanic way. And while I'm plugging my favorite books and movies on fungi, uh, this is my favorite book on medicinal mushrooms done by my pal Christopher Hobbs. There's lots of mushroom news to share with you. I'm sure many of you have seen uh, how to Change Your Mind, the excellent new Netflix series, four-part series, hosted by Michael Pollan, based on his best-selling book, uh, How to Change Your Mind. And the second episode is based on magic mushrooms. So again, uh, those of you thirsting for more information, thirsting for more fungi, uh, I, I highly recommend you check this out. Now, it's always uh, a challenge doing these Facebook Live sessions and here's why, because there's people that have eaten way more magic mushrooms than I have, and there's people who could hardly tell a mushroom from an angiosperm, a flowering plant. So my challenge is to address everyone so we all come away with something uh, to listen and learn something new. But one thing that I want to do at the outset is ask everybody where they're dialing in from, because that helps us phrase, uh, frame the conversation and, and the questions. So please put in the chat where you're dialing in from. And also, this is a, a conversation, not a lecture. So feel free to put in there where you want to hear more or less, more about or ergot fungi, less about psilocybe, uh, as unlikely as that seems. So with Plants of the Gods, we're trying to cover entheogenic substances, primarily plants. I'm an ethnobotanist, not an ethnomycologist. That is, I study how indigenous peoples know and use uh, plants for healing purposes certainly psychedelic purposes, hallucinogenic, entheogenic purposes is one, but there are other medicinal purposes for plants that aren't psychoactive. That's what makes this field endlessly fascinating. And as everyone knows, we're now in what's being called the psychedelic renaissance because Western medicine has suddenly woken up to the idea that, hey, these indigenous healers, these shamans, these curanderos, these medicine women know stuff that Harvard and Yale and Cambridge and Oxford educated PhDs and MDs uh, don't know or are beginning to know they're late to the party. So for an ethnobotanist, the idea that somebody who is preliterate, uh, somebody who doesn't wear any clothes, uh, knows a lot more than a Harvard MD or PhD is old news. 
but uh, we're, we're happy to welcome aboard the scientists who are realizing the importance of this work. And that I want to give a shout out to people like Charlie Grobe at UCLA, Dennis McKenna, who really kept the flame burning uh, through the dark period that we've just emerging from, where these drugs were not only uh, shunned, they were looked down upon and made illegal, uh, due in large part to Nixon's war on drugs. A lot of this was more about racism than it was about protecting the public good. I mean, let me ask you guys out there, who thinks that uh, alcohol and tobacco are uh, less dangerous than marijuana? And in Plants of the Gods, we have three episodes on marijuana. How many people think that alcohol and tobacco are uh, less dangerous than magic mushrooms? Uh, very few of you, I'll bet. That being said, uh, I want to emphasize that I believe these plants of the gods, these fungi of the gods, these magic frogs of the gods, which I covered in a recent interview with uh, Hamilton Morris, have a downside. I mean, they are literally uh, psychiatric scalpels. The shamans use these substances to find, analyze, diagnose, treat, and sometimes cure conditions which our own physicians cannot. And I want to emphasize also on the, on the subject of microdosing, which is a very hot topic right now, that these hallucinogens can be used in non-hallucinogenic ways uh, for healing purposes. And we're looking at these hallucinogens, entheogens for the treatment and sometimes cure of um, diseases which were obviously considered uh, incurable. That is, uh, PTSD, obsessive compulsive disorder, obesity, depression, insomnia, the list goes on. But what's interesting about microdosing, since somebody's already asked about that, is that uh, my pal uh, Charles Nichols, Dr. Charles Nichols at the LSU Medical School in my hometown in New Orleans, is looking at tiny, teeny, tiny doses of hallucinogenic substances, which are not hallucinogenic in those instances, and they're opening up new possibilities of treating uh, asthma, for example. So the point I want to make here is that these are uh, healing uh, substances, magical substances, which open new vistas in treatment of just about everything, potential treatment, everything from cancer to xenophobia, if that can be cured in this day and age. So let's talk a bit more about mushrooms. I want to do three things today. I want to focus on magic mushrooms, past, present, and future. Even though there is so much interest in this stuff, even though there is, uh, there are billions of dollars being poured into the commercialization of this, which we can get into in a bit, uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about the origin. Now, the origin of this goes back to prehistoric time. I'm sure some of you have heard about the uh, stoned ape hypothesis. An ethnobiologist, uh, the, the late Terence McKenna, suggested that 100,000 years ago, when primate brains expanded to the capacity that we enjoy them, uh, that this was when these primates, our ancestors, discovered magic mushrooms. There's a competing theory called the stoned ape theory, which is that our ancestors fed on fruits. Uh, the ripest fruits fall from the tree. Uh, they're full of sugars. They're the sweetest, but those sugars begin to ferment. So were these monkeys getting high or were these monkeys getting drunk? I vote for both. But that is much debated in the scientific community. Now, I was a student of Richard Schultes. Richard Schultes is a seminal figure in the psychedelic renaissance. He played an almost zelig-like role. He started his work in college uh, studying peyote amongst the Kiowa peoples in Oklahoma, then went to Central America, Southern Mexico, the state of Oaxaca, which I'm going to talk quite a bit about. And there is, with the Mazatec in the village of Huatla de Jimenez, he discovered magic mushrooms. Now, Schultes was always the first one to say that uh, ethnobotanists don't discover anything that our indigenous guides and teachers teach them to us. So I always say discover, uh, set off in quotation marks. And it was Schulte's work which led to the widespread interest and use of psilocybin, which my buddy Paul Stamets has called the Einstein molecule. So powerful and so useful is psilocybin for so many things that it's really almost causing a, a one alkaloid uh, revolution 
in uh, Western medical science. And I want to delve into that deeper because as a student of Schulte's, I had a front row seat, a 50 yard line seat at what was going on. I worked in the Harvard Botanical Museum uh, first as a student, uh, then as a researcher. And I worked long and closely with all these key figures. I knew Hoffman, uh, I knew uh, Gordon Wasson, who was often called the father of ethnomycology. So let's talk a bit about the discovery of uh, mushrooms for therapeutic purposes. Now, the Spanish chroniclers 500 years ago during the conquest of the Aztecs recorded quite a bit of the Aztec use of magic mushrooms in their ceremonies. Interestingly enough, as the church took over and tried to vanquish all indigenous beliefs and plant use, there's a great quote which has been attributed to an anthropologist called J.S. Slotkin, but further research, and I covered this in the peyote episode of Plants of the Gods, I think actually it was stated by Quana Parker, the great Comanche war leader. And he said, the reason that, Rush, that Westerners and Western religious leaders are so threatened by the use of these plants and fungi by indigenous peoples is that the white man goes into his church meeting house and, and talks about Jesus. And the indigenous person goes into his or her teepee, takes peyote and talks to Jesus. So the Spaniards trying to beat, literally, Christianity into the Indians did not want them using peyote or magic mushrooms. So, so successful were they at seemingly extirpating, extirpating this practice that for a long time, hundreds and hundreds of years, Western researchers couldn't find any proof that indigenous peoples were in fact using mushrooms for uh, divination, that is, you know, looking into the future, looking into the spirit world for healing purposes. And there was a very famous and very well-regarded botanist, ethnobotanist, an ethnobotanist, a person who studies uh, the use of plants by local peoples. And he did very important work on Datura. Datura is uh, an ornamental and a hallucinogenic plant. We know it in this country as angel's trumpet or devil's trumpet widely used in South America, where it's mostly native to, for divin divinatory purposes and for the healing of bed sores, which is another lecture. Maybe I'll do that next time. But Safford, after doing this important and uh, accurate work on Datura, decided that there were no magic mushrooms. This was just a wives tale of indigenous peoples trying to mislead the Spaniards, that in fact, it was peyote and they wanted to mislead the Spaniards by saying, oh, it's the mushrooms, and, and meanwhile, secretly eating the peyote. But Schultes, my mentor, who, when doing his research on peyote, was working in the herbarium. Schultes did his research in the Harvard herbarium primarily. He's a Harvard man. But he's down in Washington working in the uh, herbarium there and found a curious note attached to a peyote specimen by a fellow named Blas Pablo Reco. Reco was an Austrian who had moved to Mexico, had a great interest in plants. And this note said, uh, the indigenous peoples of Mexico in the South are in fact using uh, mushrooms for uh, hallucinogenic purposes. And that practice continues. Well, if you're a student of Joyce Campbell, like, like I am, uh, this in the hero's journey is the call to adventure. When you find a summons to choose the path of romance and adventure, and in this case, healing. And Schultes followed that lead. He graduated from Harvard College, began his uh, graduate studies also at Harvard, and decided to study the indigenous peoples of Oaxaca in southern Mexico uh, with an eye towards finding out if this magic mushroom uh, report was in fact accurate. Schultes joined forces with Reco, but he made a very unpleasant discovery. Reco was an ardent Nazi. As I said, he was born in Austria. So Schultes recalled the story to me. He's traveling with this guy. And, and Reco said to him, you know, this, now this is in the late 30s. This is the run up to World War II. Reco said to Schultes, he said, do you know that Roosevelt is a Jew? And, and Schulte said, no, he isn't. Roosevelt is a Dutch name. He's not Jewish. And Rico said, oh, yeah, he's, he's a Jew. 
And Schulte said, no, he's a, he's a American of, of Dutch ancestry. And Rico said, I think you're a Jew too. So Schultes quickly realized that Rico may have been a good physician and a good ethnobotanist, but he was a little crazy. And Schultes looked at him and told me this with a smile and said, let's stick to the fungi. So they went down to Oaxaca and found there were actually three tribes, the Mazatecs, the Genentecs, and another, I think the Zapotecs, that were using these mushrooms for uh, magic and for healing purposes. And interestingly enough, one of the major uses of these magic mushrooms, which to this day the Mazatec called Los Niños Santos, uh, was to find lost objects. So if you couldn't find something, you would go to the shaman and you would do a velada, which is what they call a mushroom ceremony, to look for lost objects. But this was a, uh, a, a, a practice which many believe never existed and which many believe was extinct. But it was thanks to Schulte's work with Reco and most importantly with the Mazatecs themselves that uh, led to bringing psilocybin, the Einstein molecule, to the outside world. Now, most people who study the discovery of the magic mushroom uh, know about Maria Sabina. Maria Sabina was the Sabia, the, the most famous uh, Mazatec healer, uh, quite a character. I mean, just an extraordinary woman, extraordinary poet. But when I worked in Oaxaca 20 years ago, I was told time and time again that Maria Sabina, as great a healer she was, she was not the only one who was that uh, that accomplished, that there were other shamans who were as good as her. I had the great honor and pleasure of working with Doña Julieta Casimiro, who was considered Maria Sabina's equal. I mean, this isn't a contest, right? But the point being that often there is not one shaman who predominates, that there are several who reach this great level. And Maria Sabina was a poet. Now, Gordon Wasson went down there and recorded her Velada, her, her ceremonial chants. And let me read you my favorite uh, quote of hers, recorded by Wasson in Mazatec, translated to Spanish, translated to English, to show you what an extraordinary poet this woman was. Quote, now the word Tionanacato is the indigenous word for flesh of the gods, because that's how they regarded these mushrooms, that you consumed it and you communicated with the Godhead. I mean, it's not unlike the Eucharist in some ways, if you think about it. So listen to this absolutely magical quote from Maria Sabina. Quote, the more you go inside the world of Tionanacatl, the more things are seen. You also see your past and your future, which are there together as a single thing, already achieved, already happened. I saw stolen horses and buried cities, the existence of which was unknown and would one day be brought to light. Millions of things I saw and knew and I saw God, an immense clock that ticks, gears that go slowly around. Inside, the stars, the earth, the universe, the day and the night, the cry and the smile, the happiness and the pain. He who makes it to the end can even see that infinite clockwork. I mean, really, has better poetry been written by anyone anywhere? I don't, I don't think so. So Maria Sabina's story is told in great detail in Michael Pollan's new series, uh, which is featured on Netflix, uh, How to Change Your Mind, highly recommended. There's four episodes, number two is on magic mushrooms. So I wanna recommend that everybody uh, tune into that. I'm also reminded to ask folks who've tuned in a little later to please put in the chat where you're dialing in from and anything that, uh, you would like me to uh, address in the course of, of this conversation. So I wanna review how uh, Wasson came to be in Oaxaca and to work with Maria Sabina, because it's a very interesting and undertold story. Wasson was an American banker, he was not a scientist, and he married a fabulous woman, a physician by the name of Valentina. So Valentino Wasson was a Russian physician married to an American banker. Here they are, I believe this was actually taken in Oaxaca. And I think one of the sad aspects of the story is that Valentina never got the recognition she deserved. Uh, I did a, an episode in the podcast called The Holy Trinity of Ethnomycology, which is usually considered to be 
uh, Schultes, Wasson, and Albert Hoffman, the synthesizer of LSD, who first discovered psilocybin from the mushrooms that Wasson and Schultes brought back from Mexico. But I tried to make the point that if we really want to be fair, it shouldn't be a holy trinity. Uh, there's five people that deserve equal credit, and Valentina Wasson and certainly Maria Sabina deserve at least as much credit, if not more. And as an ethnobotanist, I want to point out that most ethnobotanists, uh, if not all, uh, have to work with physicians at some point to understand what our indigenous peoples, what our indigenous colleagues and teachers are telling us. Now, there are a few ethnobotanists who are physicians. I'm thinking of Charlie Limbach. I'm thinking of Tom Carlson. But most of us have to consult or work with physicians in the field. This is why Valentina's partnership with her husband, Gordon, was so important because it turbocharged his efforts. He really would have understood a lot less than he did if he didn't have a physician at his elbow. And an oft-told story, uh, once Gordon and Valentina got married, they were honeymooning in the Catskills and they were walking down a forest path and saw some mushrooms. And Valentina said, oh, goody, let's collect them and cook them up and eat them. And Gordon was horrified. It's like, no, they're toadstools. They'll kill us. Well, she'd grown up in Russia where people really appreciate mushrooms. I mean, this is true throughout much of Eastern Europe in particular. So she brought them back and cooked them up. Gordon wouldn't touch them. And when she woke up uh, happy and healthy the next day, he was converted to the cause. So that they began writing a book, a classic work called uh, Russia Mushrooms in History, which is a bit mistitled because it was to talk about the impact of fungi on world culture and history. And one of the things they became interested in was the death of the Emperor Claudius. Now, this is perhaps the world's oldest cold case. All of you have watched cold cases on TV that they ultimately solved. The Emperor Claudius was poisoned uh, with mushrooms by his wife, Agrippina. But nobody ever figured out what those mushrooms were. So Valentina, not Gordon, Valentina said, Let's write the world authority on Claudius and see if he can help us figure this out. And that person was Robert Graves. Robert Graves was a poet and a writer and a classic scholar. He wrote a book called I, Claudius. I can't recommend it highly enough. It's one of the greatest books I've ever read. I, Claudius, a fictional autobiography of the Emperor Claudius, part of the uh, Claudian line. Um, you know, a descendant of Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar. And he wrote this by going into the, the history and did a deep reading of people like Suetonius, which I also highly recommend if you love a good scandal, and Dio Cassus, and reconstructed this autobiography. Not only was it turned into a great uh, book, but it became an excellent series on BBC, also highly recommended. So Valentina had the idea of reaching out to Graves and they started a, a lively correspondence. This resulted in a paper in the Botanical Museum leaflets, which when I was a, a student with Wade Davis working in the Botanical Museum in the 70s, it was published on a hand-operated press in the basement of the Botanical Museum. It had very, uh, very limited readership. Schulte was kind of proud of that. But that's where his paper on Tio Nanakadal, the discovery of the magic mushrooms of the Mazatex was first published. That's where his discovery of ayahuasca was first published. And this is where uh, Gordon Lawson's paper, Solving the Mystery of, of uh, the, the Murder of Claudius, was called uh, The Murder of Claudius Mushrooms, no, The Death of Claudius Mushrooms for Murderers in 1972. But an interesting aspect of this, side note, is that it was authored by Gordon. He didn't uh, put Valentina as a co-author. Well, she passed on by then, in fairness to him. But I will say that one of the last things uh, Wasson did before he passed away was he donated all of his books and his collection to the Harvard Botanical Museum and insisted it be called the Valentina and Gordon Wasson Collection. So anyhow, uh, Wasson, uh, both Wassons were interested in the history and impact of mushrooms, but they didn't know that there were magic mushrooms outside of Amanita muscaria in Siberia. So uh, Graves wrote them a note saying, 
hey, I just read this paper in the SIBA bulletin saying that hallucinogenic mushrooms are still used for healing purposes in Mexico uh, in this paper by a guy named Richard Schultes. And I'm proud to say that I was able to put this together and went into the Harvard Botanical Museum archives in the Harvard Herbarium and found the actual paper and note inscribed by Graves and sent to Wasson. So this connects how it went from uh, the, the Maztecs to Schultes, uh, to Heiser who wrote the article, to Graves to Wasson, a, a bit of complicated history, kind of a fun ethnobotanical, ethnomycological, correction, a detective story. Now, my colleague Antonio is here. Uh, do you have a question for us, Antonio? Yeah, we have a couple of questions. Mark, you're talking about Maria Sabina. Um, but uh, one of the questions is that in the past, you've talked about and stressed the importance of having a shaman or a traditional healer's supervision or guidance during the use of different kinds of uh, traditional uh, substances like ayahuasca. Um, could you talk a little bit about what you think about the importance of the role of a traditional healer in the use of magic mushrooms? Well, as an ethnobotanist, that is a person who works with indigenous peoples to document the uses of plants and fungi and magic frogs and all that other good stuff. Uh, I always believe that people need a guide. And ideally that should be a shaman, but there aren't enough shamans in Oaxaca to go around considering the interest in magic mushrooms. But there are a growing number of guides who will lead you through these journeys and make sure you don't get in trouble, or if you do get in trouble, they help pull you back. And anybody who's had extensive experience with these mind altering substances, whether it's psilocybin or, or, or magic mushrooms or LSD or MDMA, eventually will have a bad time of it and need somebody's help. So uh, some people seem to have the idea that, you know, ayahuasca is dangerous and magic mushrooms are fun. I think that's a ridiculous oversimplification. And I recommend that anybody and everybody have a guide with them. And yes, if you're doing ayahuasca, you should do it with a guide in the Amazon. But now we see because of the commercial interest, you have these rent to shamans where people still get in trouble. So it's let the buyer beware. But yes, I, I, I want to emphasize, I always do two things. One is that these things can heal you and they can hurt you. And that you always need to have somebody looking after your welfare, uh, somebody that knows what they're doing. And I'll make another point. You know, I used to do a fair amount of teaching before the pandemic hit. And students would always say, well, you know, I don't want to go into ethnobotany because there's no jobs. You know, what do you see the job market looking like? And I said, well, looking at your generation, I think the number one job you could take that will guarantee you employment for the rest of your life will be tattoo removal. This is going to be very big when you're my age. Number two is hallucinogenic guide because there the demand is, is only going to grow and the supply of guides is very, very, very limited. So when you look around and you see uh, programs like the one at Johns Hopkins, which was specifically established within the medical school, sponsored and inspired in part by my pal, Tim Ferriss. Uh, you see that there's programs now at the Imperial College in London, Harvard, Yale, UCLA. Uh, these programs are sprouting up everywhere. And as we integrate these successfully into Western medicine, we're going to need people to help lead other people through it. They're, the doctors are never going to have enough time to train to do this on their own. This is a huge market, and it's only going to get huger as we move forward. Other questions? Um, yeah, we have time. If we have time, let's do another one. Um, so I'm Antonio from the Amazon Conservation Team. I work closely with Mark um, in our work to help protect the Amazon in partnership with Indigenous peoples. And the next question is a little bit more relevant to ACT, um, which is what do magic mushrooms in Mexico have to do uh, with conservation of the Amazon? Well, it's an excellent question. I don't know who came up with that, but, you know, it, it speaks to the heart of what we're getting at, which is it's all the same thing. Because protecting indigenous wisdom and fungi and plants in Oaxaca is as important as doing it in the Amazon. And I, I find it a bit frustrating with all this emphasis on hallucinogens. Everybody's talking about psilocybin and ayahuasca. Well, what else is out there? You know, nobody knew there were magic frogs until Lauren McIntyre found them 
uh, when I say nobody, no non-indigenous person on the border with uh, Peru and, and, and Brazil in 1969. And when Schultes was working in Oaxaca, he had no d idea that there was a hallucinogenic mint, which is what salvia divinorum is, which was a totally wild and wacky chemical, unlike anything ever seen before. Albert Hoffman himself, who discovered and synthesized the LSD, couldn't figure out why this plant was so hallucinogenic. So there's more stuff out there. The point being that all species offer some sort of therapeutic potential somehow. So it shouldn't be like, yeah, let's focus on Oaxaca because they gave us psilocybin and not worry about what happens in, in the Brazilian Amazon or what happens in the boreal forest of Canada. And the same thing goes through, holds true with indigenous peoples. These are the index, you know, at the back of the book. These are the people that, that know these things best and how to use them and what the dosage and what phase of the moon to collect them. So it is not just about uh, one state and, and one mushroom. And if you read any of, of, of Paul Stamets stuff or, or Christopher Hobbs stuff, you see that mushrooms uh, might save the world. I, I, I can't point to any other group of organisms that seems more promising. You know, when you look at leather made from mushrooms, when you look at Stamets and his lectures, hats made from mushrooms, when you look at all the compounds, when you look at bee colony collapse, which may be uh, extirpated by some of these compounds in these other mushrooms. When you consider the fact that mushrooms, that fungi are the least explored and probably medically most promising group of organisms, I mean, let me make something clear as a biologist. You know, when I studied uh, in, in school, mushrooms were always like an add-on to my botany course. Like and mushrooms were these sort of run to the litter. They were, they were kind of plants that were too stupid to figure out how to photosynthesize. But we now know that fungi are a separate kingdom. We now know that fungi are more closely related to animals than are plants. This is wild stuff here, okay? Some of you, many of you probably heard of ergot, the fungus uh, that led to the, the Salem witch trials. The fungus, which is probably the basis of the Eleusinian mysteries. If you want to read more about this, read an excellent book called The Immortality Key, written by my pal Brian Murray Rescue. Spelled like it sounds. But my uh, colleague, Glenn Shepard, who's one of the greatest ethnobotanists in, in the 21st century, living with indigenous peoples in the Peruvian Amazon for years and years and years and years and years, was shown a fungus called Piri Piri, which does everything from improve their ability as jugglers to uh, help in difficult childbirth, which is the original use of ergot in which some ergot alkaloids, that is some chemicals extracted ergot, are still used for today. This is covered in an episode of, of the Plants of the Gods podcast. Well, when they looked at it in the laboratory, uh, Piri Piri yielded seven new ergot-like alkaloids. So even stuff we know well is yielding new stuff. And remember that it was ergot, which was being studied by Albert Hoffman, and he was trying to synthesize, you know, weird and different versions of it to see if they have therapeutic effects. The 25th thing he created, inspired by the ergot alkaloids, was LSD-25. So even when you find something new in nature, which may or may not be useful in and of itself, it could teach us new things about the human nervous system, could teach us new things about the human brain, can inspire us to create uh, semi-synthetic chemicals which could have very important therapeutic or even industrial uses. So that's why it's such an exciting time to be studying this stuff. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, curious about supplements that can support a microdose journey like lion's mane. Again, I want to refer everyone to what's called the Stamets stack, S-T-A-M-E-T-S. It is a prescription for a microdose regimen. There's actually several microdose regimens out there. Uh, nobody has proven one is better than the other. Uh, Stamets is my go-to guy on this stuff. But the Stamets stack, as I recall, is uh, microdoses of psilocybin, uh, lion's mane, and vitamin B, uh, niacin. So, you know, do your own research. Uh, but have a look at that. Uh, my buddy Chris Hobbs' book, uh, Medicinal Mushrooms, that I uh, held up earlier, excellent book, came out a year or two ago, has a section on, on microdosing. 
And this is a very exciting time because microdosing is yet another example of we know something seems to do good, but we don't have the scientific proof yet. Understand that willow bark, which is eventually became aspirin, we used for hundreds and hundreds of years uh, before scientists were able to figure out that it was had to do with prostaglandins in the human body, and that's why it was such an effective treatment for headaches. Nobody waited hundreds of years to find out the therapeutic pathway to use the stuff that was shown to be safe and effective. So I am definitely uh, an admirer of microdosing. I've tried a little bit myself, but I'm not a, I'm not a physician. I don't recommend anything. I don't prescribe stuff, but I do think this is something that everyone uh, should look into. And so we have a question about what advice uh, uh, and where to start on place to visit for journey experiences in South America. Again, this is not something the Amazon conservation team does. We don't have a lodge, we don't do eco tours. So I always emphasize, uh, let the buyer beware. But there are an increasing number of lodges which are uh, having a, a, a better reputation. So that I know the Takiwasi Lodge, T-A-K-I-W-A-S-I in Peru, which was set up in partnership between physicians and shamans, uh, has a, a very good recommendation, a very good reputation. But the uh, founder just passed away recently, so I don't know how that has uh, affected things. There's a, a wonderful fellow uh, by the name of Luis Eduardo Luna, who is half Colombian and half uh, Witoto. Uh, indigenous group uh, known as the Muinanis. Uh, uh, the Amazon conservation team has the honor of working with them. Look on our website, amazonteam.org, to learn more about that. Has a lodge called Wakiwasi Lodge, W-A-K-I-W-A-S-I, -A -I, uh, in Brazil. And I've heard good things about it. Luis Eduardo is certainly somebody who's been studying this uh, as long as I have, maybe even longer. So uh, he's a wonderful fellow, but there's lots more about this stuff on the uh, on the internet. And is taking magic mushrooms uniform consistent experience? No taking of any uh, entheogen uh, in my experience has been consistent. I was working with a Siona shaman, 92 years old, he was proud to point out, and he gave me a glass of ayahuasca to drink. It was like a coffee cup. I mean, I thought this is going to kill me. And I took it and had a very profound experience. Uh, this is with my partner, Liliana Madrigal, a group that we work with, the Sionas in the Colombian Amazon. And then a couple of days later, he said, okay, now we're going to do it again. Drink this. And he poured out the same liquid, hardly enough to cover at the bottom of the coffee cup. And I was like, come on, you know, I, 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 I've been around the block here. You can give me more. It's like, no, do it. And I had the same experience in terms of profundity based on something which scientifically makes absolutely no sense. So that's why so much of this is uh, science and magic. And I, I can't always explain it, but it's uh, uh, consistently, profoundly uh, surprising and ultimately uh, therapeutic uh, experience uh, for most of us in most cases. So uh, we have a question about the Telluride Mushroom Festival. This is next week in Telluride. It's going to feature uh, wonderful people like Christopher Hobbs, uh, Juliana Furci, the Chilean uh, ethnomycologist who's also doing some work in Oaxaca. Uh, Alan Rockefeller, who's done some genetic work on magic mushrooms, will be there. It's really a, a, a great lineup. So I hope to see some of you there. Please come up and introduce yourself in person. I'm going to be doing a very in-depth lecture on the life and times of Richard Schultes in ethnomycology. And uh, this I it was described to me as the Super Bowl of mycology slash ethnobotany, but uh, uh, time will tell. So does Harvard have training courses in uh, ethnobotany? No, Harvard in her infinite wisdom uh, does not do anything with ethnobotany when Schultes retired. They let it lapse, not unlike my, uh, my one of my idols, Alexander Hamilton Rice, who invented mapping from the air, map the Amazon from the air, set up the Harvard Institute of Geographical Research. And Harvard, when he retired, decided there was no future in mapping from the air. I guess Google Earth didn't get the memo. Um, but once again, Harvard, in her infinite wisdom, uh, let this lapse. You do now have work at the Harvard Medical School in terms of integrating psychedelics into Western medicine. They're doing great stuff there, but they've really dropped the ball 
on uh, ethnobotany. Other questions. How does psilocybin and magic mushrooms differ from ayahuasca? I wish I knew the answer. I mean, I wish I could say, oh, uh, psilocybin is this and ayahuasca is that. I can't. Uh, I mean, there's, Schultes wrote a classic paper saying uh, when he asked his indigenous guide about ayahuasca, the guy said, well, if you take the stuff from this part of the vine, you see jaguars. If you take this part, you see anaconda. If you take this part, you see landscapes. And it was talking about the same plant. So, no, I, I, I can't give you a, a difference. There's a chemical difference. I mean, psilocybin is the basis uh, for the magic mushrooms. We know, the, we know the molecule well. Ayahuasca, as I point out in my book, Amazon, uh, my most recent book from Oxford University Press, ayahuasca is a plant and it's a potion because ayahuasca, when you take it in the Amazon, is always the ayahuasca vine with another plant, uh, chacruna, a psychotra from the coffee family, complex chemical interaction I won't go into now. But we also know there's a hundred different plants that have been recorded, and that means there's others out there, that shamans use as ayahuasca admixtures. One of the shamans that I've worked with the most in Colombia regularly uses Brugmansia, which is philotropic and alkalis, which scares the hell out of me, but he knew what he was doing. So uh, these are complicated questions. I think in, in this sense, we have to consider uh, psilocybin more straightforward. But even in my experience with, with, with psilocybin, which is a much less than with that of ayahuasca, uh, the experience has never been the same. Uh, Antonio? Yeah, Mark, uh, more questions. Um, but one's about the podcast, Plants of the Gods. Do you have any episodes, future episodes planned that will deal with mushrooms? Yeah, I want to do one on Amanita muscaria. Many of you know Amanita muscaria. It's been called the Santa Claus mushroom. It's easy to find on the internet. It's bright red with, with white spots. It was traditionally used by Siberian healers, and many have called Siberia the cradle of shamanism, that the shamanism was born there and then brought across the Bering Strait to the Americas. I happen to think that shamanism is ubiquitous in these hunter-gatherer cultures. It wasn't invented in Siberia. But nonetheless, it's a great story because uh, not only do the Siberian shamans use this for the purpose of healing and divination, the reindeer uh, have been recorded uh, eating these, uh, these mushrooms. So this is a fascinating story in and of itself. And there are many who have hypothesized that Santa Claus is actually a magic mushroom, that the white and red we associate with Santa Claus uh, is due to the coloration of the uh, Amanita uh, mushroom. Not everybody accepts this theory, but it's an interesting one. And, and you know, one of my interests in ethnobotanists is how have plants, how have fungi impacted culture? Let me give you another example from the fungal world. Okay, we all know that wine is made from grapes, but the sugar in the grapes is turned into alcohol by yeasts. Yeasts are fungi. Now, I did a paper, it's on my website, markplotkin.com, called the medical ethnobotany of wine in the ancient world. And I set out to prove that wine was the most important plant uh, other than the cereal grains, that is wheat and corn and things like that, in terms of the impact on human culture. Here's one example. Wine was the original antibiotic because wine uh, does kill bacteria. This is before you know, the advent of penicillin. And if you go back to the earliest records of medicine, the earliest prescription known which is a cuneiform tablet from Iraq, uh, had wine in the prescription. So that wine was used to kill bacteria. Wine was also used to extract the compounds from the plants that were soaked in the wine. So that uh, this is another way that, that, that fungi have impacted civilization. It's not just antibiotics. It's not just magic mushrooms. And we're also finding out that fungi, or essentially what we call endophytes, it, that fungi live in plants and produce some of these medical compounds like Taxol, the anti-cancer superstar, extracted from the Pacific U, uh, is apparently produced a, 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 to a large degree, if not completely, by these endophytes, these fungi living in the leaves of the taxis plant. So the fungi story is just beginning. And, you know, the more we, we study, the more we learn, the more questions there are. Yeah, yeah. Mark, another question. 
And traditionally, or the way that we tend to hear about shamans uh, is that they are men. But as we've seen in some of these different traditions, like with mushrooms, there are women, shaman, and healers. Can you speak a little bit about or to um, the role of women, shaman, or female shaman? Well, this is part of my uh, beef with Western medicine. And, and mind you, I'm not a particularly politically correct person. Women have been getting the, the, the short end of the stick all along. You know, one of the reasons witches were burned at the stake, uh, I think, I mean, historians have written this, it's not my idea, is that they were a threat to organized medicine, which was run by males. Uh, William Withering, the guy who discovered Digitalis, the heart drug, well, actually, he was taught that by female herbalists. Okay, the invention of, 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 of the vaccine, vaccinations, invented by Edward Jenner, except Edward Jenner didn't invent crap. It was the milkmaids who pointed out to him that when they got scratches and got cowpox from the cows, they didn't get smallpox. Who's the woman who taught that to Edward Jenner? Edward Jenner is in every history of medicine textbook in the world. So we see the same thing with uh, shamans. Now, we'll say this. Uh, that in these hunter-gatherer cultures, in these indigenous cultures, which I've had the honor and privilege to work with, uh, there tend to be very few women shamans. Why? Because women, like everywhere else, are doing most of the work. Uh, they don't have time to be shamans. Also, there's some taboos that women can't become full-blooded shaman until menopause. This is another lecture. I'm going to do that another time. But in the Shipibo culture, in the Peruvian Amazon, uh, some of the great Paramount shamans are women. Amongst the Mazatec, most of the paramount shamans are women, but not the only ones. So that uh, you do have female herbalists in every tribe I've been with. And that herbalists are women who tend to focus on plants that are useful for treating children's ailments and female problems, whether it's problems in childbirth, uh, menstrual problems, stuff like that. So that, yes, there are female shamans. Yes, there are female herbalists. Um, but in many of these tribes that I have uh, lived or worked or visited over the years, uh, most of the shamans uh, have been men. We have another one here up on the screen. Mark, are you aware of other organizations or any other organization where you can volunteer in South America to carry out similar work to your organization, the Amazon Conservation Team? You know, there's an organization called Earthwatch. There's an organization called School for Field Studies. I've lost track of them over the years. But the idea was to put uh, students or aspiring researchers into the field uh, to get a taste of it. Because field research sounds like a, a lot more fun than it can be, you know, when you're eating bad food and drinking bad water and sleeping in a noisy hotel in some godforsaken third world hellhole, which believe me, I've done plenty of. So that uh, 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 there were some courses on ethnobotany. I mean, you could go to Africa and study zebras. Uh, you could go to the Gobi Desert and do uh, paleontology. This, these are great ideas. Uh, I don't know the status of those organizations these days. I mean, when I was in college, a uh, junior year abroad would send you to an exotic place like England. You know, now you have programs in countries didn't even exist when I was in college. So I would look into that. I mean, if you're affiliated with the university, even if just check university websites, because some of these programs are not just for students or for alumni or, or people living nearby. But yes, there are many uh, courses like this now, uh, way more than, you know, decades ago when I was back in school. And I always think if you really don't know what you're doing, start out in, in a program which is going to look after you and, and, and keep you out of trouble. Uh, you're not going to make any of the mistakes that those of us who did this without the benefit of a program or a, a good mentor made that, that seemed unnecessary in retrospect. So, yes, I encourage people to go down there with a the program, uh, get a taste of it. Now, we have a, a question about tobacco. Yes, I will be doing an episode on tobacco. It's, it's such a, an incredible plant. Uh, talk about a plant that heals and a plant that kills. I mean, that's tobacco par excellence. I'm most interested in the uh, shamanic aspects. I'm not interested in the cigarette trade per se. That's not my, not in my wheelhouse. But I will tell you that when I was in the Shingu, which is this incredible indigenous herb that our uh, uh, colleague Antonio has worked in, that uh, one of the great shamans 
uh, gave me something to smoke, and it was a, a tobacco. But uh, well, to call it a cigar is not to do it justice. About this long, <laughs> this long, and and I smoked it. I got quite a buzz from it. And then afterwards, we were sitting around talking, and I said, "Do you guys get, you know, like cancer and diseases of the lungs from smoking this stuff?" And he goes, "No." And I said, "Why not?" And he said, "Because we purge. In your culture, you never purge. You know, you never get the bad stuff out of your body." If you go through life, you ingest a lot of bad stuff, whether it's pollution or pesticides, whatever. And, and, and we always purge. And he said, I'll show you what I mean. Come by in a couple hours. So I came on and he said, here, drink this. Well, this stuff tasted like soap. And I puked my guts out. And he said, now that's a purge. Any other questions? Okay. Well... Uh, I, I want to give another example of the shamanic aspects of, of all this and the, and the story of how uh, these magic mushrooms came to the fore. That uh, when Harvard was building its herbarium for fungi, which is separate from its herbarium for plants, the Harvard herbarium is for flowering plants, what we call angiosperms. The Farlow herbarium is uh, where they keep their, their fungi, their fungi specimens, one of the largest in the world, over a million specimens. So in raising the money to build the Farlow Herbarium, they went to a fellow whose name is probably familiar to you, J.P. Morgan Jr. J.P. Morgan Jr. was one of the uh, biggest, most important, wealthiest, successful bankers uh, in the world at the time. But the reason they went to J.P. Morgan Jr. was at Harvard, he studied business, but his minor was mycology. So he studied fungi. So J.P. Morgan Jr. underwrote at least a part of the Farlow Herbarium uh, where the mushrooms were stored. Now, Gordon Wasson was originally a banker. As I said, he was not a scientist. And he was working for J.P. Morgan when he got sent the paper for Robert Graves that clued him onto Schulte's work that proved that there were mushrooms in use in southern Mexico. So Wasson was working for J.P. Morgan, who underwrote the Farlow Herbarium, which still stands at Harvard today at the foot of Divinity Avenue. And that is where Schultes and Wasson's mushrooms are stored. So it's one of these shamanic circles. Any other questions? Well, I want to read a story which I think uh, gets back into this shamanic aspect. Mark, you and up on the screen before you hop into that. We have a few minutes left here. Um, do we have any suggestions for where to learn about hallucinogens that are available locally in the north? We don't have information for northern Canada. Yes. First of all, I don't know of many hallucinogens from that part of, of, of our hemisphere that far north, but the world authority on the ethnobotany of the indigenous peoples of Canada is a wonderful woman named Nancy Turner who is, I believe, at the University of British Columbia. So that'd be your go-to reference. Uh, she's published a lot on the peoples up there, and she would know more about this than I do. So I want to uh, conclude with a story, and that is about Wasson in Oaxaca. Wasson went to Oaxaca in 1953. Uh, the indigenous peoples were not very interested in sharing the information with them. They were not interested in inviting him to participate in the ceremony. And in 1955, he got to sit on a, on a ceremony. They did not allow him to take the, the magic mushrooms, which they call Los Niños Santos, the sainted little ones. So I want to read you an account from a book by Andy Letcher, a book called Shroom, which I highly recommend. It's a really wonderfully written and, and researched book about Wasson's first experience observing the ceremony as a skeptical Westerner. Quote, late in the day, after much fruitless searching, during which the taciturn Mazatecs proved more than a little reticent on the subject of the mushrooms, the Wassons discovered to their surprise that their local guide was himself a shaman. <coughs> after a bit of persuasion, he agreed to hold the ceremony to determine the health and well-being of Wasson's son, Peter, who was in New York. Wasson was at last able to witness and make detailed records of an authentic ceremony, which the indigenous peoples call a velada. 
He politely humored the mouse attack when the results of the mushroom assisted divination revealed Peter to not be in Boston where he lived, as Wasson believed, but in New York and in a state of emotional turmoil. On returning home, however, Wasson found things to be exactly as predicted. The enterprising Peter had made use of his father's absence to hold a party in their swank New York apartment and was indeed in the state of adolescent turmoil, having been spurned by his girlfriend, or in the words of Wasson, the shaman had, skewered, had scored a palpable hit. Now I can't explain the shaman's prediction to the prism of Western science, but as an ethnobotanist, I've learned to listen and to learn. Anything else as we wind up here? Okay, well, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, please put in the chat, if you haven't already, where you're dialing in from. And let me know what else you'd like to hear more about uh, in terms of entheogens, hallucinogens, or ideogens, that is, these mind-altering substances that inspire creativity. Let us know if you'd like more science or less. Uh, let us know your request for podcast episodes, like our colleague who said, let's do one on, on tobacco. Uh, I will be featuring more guests in season four because there's so many stories to tell. It shouldn't be all just my take on things. I hope to have Christopher Hobbs on. I hope to have Juliana Furci. And most important of all, I hope to invite some of my shamanic teachers and colleagues to be on. That hasn't been possible with the pandemic, but now hopefully uh, that's winding down. Hopefully monkeypox doesn't kill us all in the meantime. And we can invite these real masters uh, so you can hear it firsthand. So I want to thank Deb Mitchell Associates. Deb and her team have made this podcast and this live cast possible. And I want to encourage other colleagues who are doing podcasts or thinking about doing it to talk to Deb and her team. They've helped us bring uh, Plants of the Gods to over 300,000 people. I want to thank my team at the Amazon Conservation Team, particularly Antonio and Kenza, who have been my wing people. Is that a word? Wingman and wingwoman? I'm not sure. Uh, to bring you this message in a timely fashion. So check out our work at the Amazon Conservation Team, amazonteam.org. Check out my personal website, markplotkin.com, for more of my writings on these topics. And subscribe to Plants of the Gods. And if you like what you hear, please give us a good reading and recommend it to others as well. So thanks to everyone. Happy trails. <laughs>